it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, a friend from long time, uh, Shiva, give uh, a talk on his uh, experience with the library. So, uh, Shiva Kumar Jolad is uh, currently the Associate Professor of Public Policy at Flame University in Pune. Uh, so, he's been in this position from 2019. So, I know him from the time when he was an Assistant Professor of Physics at IIT Gandhinagar uh, with a joint appointment in the Social Sciences, where he was actively engaged in studying epidemiology. In fact, that's how we met. Uh, Shiva first came to Institute of Mathematical Sciences uh, where he gave a wonderful talk on ma modeling epidemics, and this is way before COVID became, uh, you know, like a household word. So um, uh, Shiva has done his PhD from uh, Penn State uh, in condensed matter physics with a minor in demography. And um, his research interests include, uh, you know, wide variety of topics like data-driven social policy, education, migration and development, and last but not the least, quantitative historical analysis. So how do you take historical data and basically analyze statistical trends from it? So without further ado, uh, Shiva. So first of all, let me start with a disclaimer. So I'm not a librarian. I not study library science formally. So this talk will be primarily from a user perspective. And I also, as most of you, barring maybe one or two, like we all started from the physical era and then moved to the digital era. In childhood, of course, we used to enjoy a lot of books, reading a lot of books, going to the public libraries. And then we moved to the academic libraries uh, when we did our undergraduate and uh, postgraduate education. And also, it is largely based upon um, my experience um, in US when I went there for master's and PhD and also postdoc. Yeah, and then dabbling with public and private libraries in India and abroad. Okay. And also, recently, in the last uh, five, six years, I have been studying a lot of historical data, like, you know, trying to use digital archives, okay, mainly like, you know, you are start from physical to what we, what I call as the physical, physical plus digital, and then the purely digital formats, and then analyzing trends like, you know, analyzing the constant assembly debates, analyzing the historical migration patterns, you know, data-driven analytics, okay. So, <clears throat> this will be based upon these things. Um, pardon me if I go wrong anywhere, especially the speakers from the morning today. So they are much more well-versed than me. Yeah. <clears throat> so one thing, it, <clears throat> I wanted to start off with this anecdote from my home, like, you know, my own son. So I deal with a lot of uh, students in college, younger generation, like, you know, from their childhood, they're all born digital generation. They had, you know, computers, you know, laptops. And newer generation, they had smartphones, you know, by the time they were born. Okay, the way they learn, they consume knowledge is very different from the way we learned and we consume knowledge, you know. So, and if you are thinking of library, like we should target them, okay. Our, <clears throat> and India's median age is around 26 years. That means most of them were born after internet came to India, okay. Yeah, so there's a generational shift. In the reading habits, you know, there is a constant complaint that people are not reading, children are not reading. So they consume more knowledge in the audio and the visual format, you know. <clears throat> and also I heard this phrase, current generation is not so much interested in knowledge creation, but in knowledge aggregation, you know. So how do you assemble multiple parts, you know. So for example, in my childhood, if I had to create a website, like I had to write an HTML code, okay. But right now there are so many templates, you don't have to do that. And I learned C language through, you know, read this books. So, like, there are a lot of online resources and um, even YouTube videos through which they learn. Okay. So, even in my classroom things, when I teach something, there are a lot of textual reading materials. You know, it is usually not consumed. Right. It is they prefer more of the audiovisual format. Like, yeah, <clears throat> and more recently, this uh, generative AI tools, chat GPT, you know, which eases information acquisition and analysis, um, especially like, you know, in my <clears throat> IT social science, you know, like it's easy to get an essay generated out of it, or uh, like even for uh, coding and all, like, you know, you can directly get things from it, okay? So in this also, like, you know, how do you 
<laughs> what is the role of physical library? What is the role of books? Okay. So uh, this is my son. So with like you know, of course he occasionally reads books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so but he also learned. Let's say he masters a language. Let's say German through Duolingo app. Okay. For me to master a language like Marathi, it took longer time using books. Right. So what is the use of you know having keeping a uh, learn German in 30 days kind of books? Okay, when you have a Duolingo type of app. You know, these are the questions that actually comes to our mind, right? You know, this is a broader thing. But I think somehow he's been smart. So he also said that, okay, sometimes internet can be wrong. I don't know how we got to know that, but there is false, you know, <clears throat> fake news, false information, all those things can be there. And books are more reliable than internet. And also he said that, okay, uh, we are rephrasing the whole thing. So all the information from internet comes from uh, the people and people get that from the books. Okay. So in that way, the traditional mode of no, uh, information and data and knowledge, you know, still has a place, you know, until we completely become AI driven. Okay. <coughs> so uh, looking at um, the physical library, so in the morning, you know, we learned a lot from um, Dr. Satya, uh, Satya Narayana and then uh, Dr. Devika Madali and also Venkata Kesavan, sir. So I won't be having too much into this, but let me share some of my experience. You know, in my childhood, I used to go to this uh, <coughs> libraries, you know, Bangalore uh, libraries. So the state government libraries, smaller ones in different localities. Okay. So they used to have traditional books, but not fancy ones. Okay. And comics and other things. Uh, of course, there was no internet kind of things. Okay. And this is the Bangalore Central Library or Karnataka Central Library or Sheshadri Iyer. Memorial Library, one of the oldest in uh, Bangalore and <clears throat> more than 100 years old. And this has more than 3.2 lakh book collections, right? So 3.2 lakh collection, but you can't issue a book here, right? So you can't issue a book, but you know, you can go and refer there. So that means its access is limited to only those people who can travel to the city center and then sit and read over there, okay? And what kind of people usually use this? Mostly like youngsters who are preparing for competitive exams, you know? So, or sometimes, you know, some old people also go there to read newspapers and other things, okay? And <clears throat> the cataloging is also not so great, to be frank. And in the smaller libraries in Bangalore, it is even bad, okay? So, you don't find the book uh, that you actually want because they are all misplaced so and library staff is not so supportive so in this also like you know uh, digital like you don't see signs of digital they don't have any computers for reading nowadays they are allowing people to carry their laptops okay previously they would even forbid people carrying their laptops right you know in that way it is purely a physical library okay but it has not changed with the times you know so very different from let's say american library which i was there for a long time. So Nehru once said that a civilization which resists change declines in the same way an institution or a library which resists ch change declines. So m people don't look after uh, this library as a good one, right? Okay, so the broader objective if you think about is knowledge, uh, dissemination of knowledge and information and also making it universally accessible. Okay, one of the access is like, you know, if you have a public library, it should be accessible to the people around it. If you restrict the access by not letting people borrow it, you know, that's, it's a, becoming discriminatory. And also help people to create new knowledge, you know, for researchers, you know, especially in academic libraries, you know, we read journals and we write papers, kind of things, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> so traditionally, like what we had was, you know, accessibility of books, magazines, media resources, news, and all those. Okay, so in the morning, Dr. Devika actually talk, uh, said that you know we need to give you know community support to this, okay, uh, and promote reading and li <coughs> literacy, art and cultural activities, digital services, provide online resources. You know we don't see any of the bottom ones in the current library. I don't know about uh, Tamil Nadu. Maybe it is much better. I have no idea because I am talking from purely my experience. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> but in general the state of public libraries are poor in um, uh, like in India, right? Yeah, so now take a small uh, library in US, you know, this is a Jefferson County Public Library in Colorado Boulder. One of my friend actually 
stays there. Yeah, so and this is typically I have gone to smaller libraries. So if you look at the infrastructure, this um, fantastic. Like you know, there is they have a library. This is a very small county, 17,000 uh, population, and <clears throat> so in that they have multiple services. Okay, so for example, book a librarian. You know, you can have a uh, adult reading programs, reading programs for the children. You know, they and it's actually a community center. So you can hold programs in that, and you can actually invite speakers to those. Okay, and <clears throat> you can of course you know borrow books, read magazines. There is also access to journals, and you can also do interlibrary uh, loan that we are talking about. The small library does all these things, and it is free for all the residents. Each person can issue, residents can issue 200 books. If, we, if there is a family of three, it's like 600 books. You know that is the kind of thing, and it's not a big city. America has this public library movement since 1850s, okay? And we had great people like uh, Andrew Carnegie who donated so much of money to build the libraries in India, right? But see, they have also, you know, <clears throat> ensured that this space is used for multiple purposes, you know, so a lot of community activities, okay? And they also provide computers and Wi-Fi, you know, there is also a service for printing, you know? So, <clears throat> and there is meeting room and study room, yeah. So many of these features, you know, today morning Dr. Devika actually talked about it. These are some of the features that we desire in a public library. Okay. Maybe academic libraries have many of these things, um, especially good academic libraries may have these things, but they are not accessible to all. Okay. In US, in Penn State, you know, our Penn State library was accessible to the community in the state college. You know, they could become members of it. Okay. We don't see that. Okay. So now, <coughs> Okay, let me switch gears with this. So, I will, since we are talking about physical to digital transformation, okay, let me briefly add and then see like, you know, the transition historically, like how it moved and then come to my analysis of the historical, uh, uh, like, you know, archives. Okay, that's why I'm talking a little bit of the history, right? So, how <coughs> media changed over time, you know, over time means you can think of uh, 100 years, 500 years, 1000 years or 3000 years. Of course, we all know in the olden times, you know, we had um, oldest, it's like we have the clay tablets or the stone inscription that um, was there at multiple places. So the collection of tablets, clay or stone, they, they were used um, to like, you know, communicate certain um, ideas or may, maybe some rules to the community, right? And India, like we had different type of writing material, cloth, palm leaf, copper, CO, sorry, this is a spelling mistake copper manuscripts. So one thing you notice that these things mm, had a longevity, like very high longevity. That's why we can still find many of these, at least stone and I think. But it needed a lot of human copiers and it also had a very restricted access in the sense, you know, especially these manuscripts used to be preserved in um, temples or some, you know, <coughs> feudal lords' homes or in the imperial palaces, okay. So that means, you know, it was not accessible to all. So very few elite scholars could actually get this. And because the, the need for human copy, <coughs> copiers or scribes, so the number of books were actually limited. Okay. Uh, these are some of the pictures that I took. So this is um, like, you know, the top one is the palm, uh, no, script in Majuli Assam and also Gauhati, some copper plates. And we had our grand libraries, of course, we all know this, you know, Naranda University, which had lot of copies of, um, you know, ancient books, but they were all burnt allegedly by Bhakti Arkelji. So, but, you know, <coughs> most of it don't survive, okay. <coughs> so, this was there, so we don't have a surviving library from that time, but uh, from the Mughal time, we start getting more well-preserved materials, okay. So, Mughals used to uh, venerate, uh, like, <coughs> like, you know, scholarship and there were a lot of libraries. This was built by Humayun. Okay, this was a pleasure house, but later converted into a library in Delhi. But now I don't think any books are there. Even Akbar, who was a semi-literate, he also, you know, built libraries in there. Okay. So, because of this, you know, <coughs> uh, like, you know, these were imperial palaces. That means, you know, access was still restricted. Fewer people could uh, access these things. Of uh, but at least, you know, we have these preserved copies in built. 
So <coughs> in that way, since we did not have printing, most of the ancient studies, you know, schools in India, like you know, we have a lot of indigenous uh, schools. Even in the 19th century, there are records in Madras report, you know, Thomas Munro report state that there are almost 100,000 schools in an around Madras, almost one school per village, you know, we used to have. But the thing is, these schools were very uh, kind of primitive, and I don't want to use that name, but it was informal schools is a better name. Uh, but this, <clears throat> the student did not have access to books. There were no libraries out there. So it was Shruti and Smriti. That means listen and then uh, memorize, right? That's why we have this oral tradition because of the lack of access to books, right? And <clears throat> that's why we also memorize a lot because that is part of our history, you know. Okay. So <clears throat> because of this, there was uh, access to modern knowledge was limited to few places, you know but not to all, okay? That started changing with um, the printing and we have this modern, um, uh, <clears throat> like, you know, of course, British and the Portuguese, they introduced printing, but we should give credit to these guys, you know, Sarampur Trio. The Sarampur is very close to uh, Calcutta. Uh, like, you know, they printed books in 30 Indian languages, you know? So that's when the first time all the Indian Tamil books, um, like, you know, like, you know, uh, Bengali, Kannada, all these books were printed in Chennai, right? So, and also the earliest libraries, we have this Asiatic Society books and then Asiatic Society Bombay, they were the earliest modern libraries that we have, okay? Later, we also have this libraries during the British era, like, you know, a lot of expansion in libraries happened, there's a timeline, I don't want to go through the entire thing, so many of them are still there, okay, different parts of India, we start getting this modern libraries in India, okay? And you see some of them are also public libraries in this uh, list, you know, Calcutta Public Library, if you think about it, right? So they become more and more accessible to people over time, right? So <clears throat> then comes the postmodern era, like, you know, you see many of the contents nowadays is, you know, born digital, like, you know, from the start, like, in you know, all the journals, everything is actually digital. And we have digital archive. And in physics itself, in 92 itself, you know, we had this archives, um, you know, where in Cornell University you could put your contents on up there. So, like, <clears throat> since 90s onwards, we are seeing this, um, you know, born digital content being made. And thanks to librarian, I think, uh, today morning itself, they said that they were online before the internet actually came up, okay? And uh, especially education institution, even in India, we had this RNET, right, Education Research Network before the internet became available to all people in India, okay? That was there. And um, <clears throat> and then we are making AI and, um, you know, machine learning, they're making information accessible to wider audience, okay? This is the postmodern era. But I want to start with this, you know, either you have born digital or you start with physical and then go to digital. So for historical research, you have to go back to that older mode, like physical to digital to fi digital. I will explain what this is. Okay, so now <coughs> we'll focus on my work. So uh, here you see like, <coughs> so digital libraries for knowledge creation. So these are the bound volumes of um, like constituent assembly debates. I hope most of you know, like you know what the constituent assembly debates were from uh, <coughs> December 1946 uh, to November 26th, uh, 1949 for almost uh, two year, 11 months, the Constituent Assembly debated about the future of Indian Constitution, right? So we had close to 300 members who worked on that, uh, participated in these debates, right? And we had these bound volumes, Lok Sabha Secretariat. And thanks to them, you know, they actually did the first level digitization. They actually scanned the whole thing, right? These debates, when you scan it, like, of course, it <coughs> thing. But just scanning is not enough. You need to have OCR, optical character recognition, so that these contents are actually made available, right? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, the next level is actually digitizing it, but even that second level digitizing is also not completely useful. It is just a bunch of text. You still have to uh, catalog them and then provide proper metadata for all of them, right? Imagine there are 12 volumes, more than 3 million words were actually spoken during this thing, okay? But people did not know this. 
ठीक है सो हाउ डू यू एनालाइज दिस काइंड ऑफ यू नो लार्ज वॉल्यूम्स ऑफ डेटा ओके ट्रेडिशनली पीपल यूज टू डू गो टू द लाइब्रेरी एंड देन रीड अबाउट इट पार्ट बाय पार्ट यू नो इट इज ह्यूमेनली इंपॉसिबल टू रीड ऑल द थिंग्स राइट आल्सो मेमोराइज दैट सो द नेक्स्ट लेवल इज एक्चुअली डिजिटाइजिंग एंड देन मेकिंग इट कैरेक्टर रिकॉग्निशन एंड देन यू नो टैगिंग देम सो दिस सेंटर फॉर लॉ एंड पॉलिसी रिसर्च सीएलपीआर बेंगलुरु they actually took this task they uh, digitized every volume of this with the data like paragraph speaker and the textual material okay what we did around almost uh, four years back was you know to get all this data and also cat <coughs> uh, like you know um, transform them in a manner which is useful for analysis like you know long excel sheet and also Uh, check for errors and all those things. You know, a lot of data cleaning was needed from our end also. They did good job. I think the final version is pretty good. Way back it was not so good, so we did this cleaning. So this kind of making information accessible in a use usable format that's extremely you you know needed uh, for the researchers. The previous digital is not so great. Okay. So because of this, we were able to extract and analyze these things. and then these are some of the results so you know of the uh, 12 volumes or maybe essentially 11 volumes uh, so you see the number of days they were in session and number of words were spoken you know in each of this thing this kind of analysis cannot be done if purely from a physical format of the thing right so we have the data for the entire thing so every volume you see that uh, longest session was in july to september 1949 um like you know and <coughs> like almost 1 million words were actually spoken during that time now this <coughs> proper tagging of the speakers and the text also enabled us to analyze this further in fact get to understand who spoke the most okay so this is ambedkar speaking and in what day they speak how many words did they speak okay and the content of those things you know we could actually do right so you see that ambedkar spoke the most jawala nehru for in many sessions you know he was silent sardar patel was silent for most of the time occasionally he made long speeches right so this time things can be quantified only if you have in a digital format right so this is historical right so there are other things that we discover there are something like hv komat who spoke next only to ambedkar okay and there are few people who never spoke okay so this kind of information we can aggregate using nlp natural language processing techniques and we could also quantify them there is something called inequality index like gini index you know so like how unequal the debate was okay thanks to this we could figure out many things like you know <coughs> the debates were highly unequal the gini index is 0.76 okay and few people especially women there were 15 women members out of which five never spoke and the members who spoke were also in the bottom part so this kind of tells you that you know unequalness of the thing right so other things we could also figure out which you couldn't do the purely textual analysis is who spoke on what topic like you know the frequency of the words and you see that let's say gandhi was spoken uh, like you know prohibition was spoken more than let's say socialism okay and gandhi was spoken um, more than equality in this things okay we also discovered some things like um, uh <clears throat> like ambedkar we know the feud between ambedkar and gandhi like that lasted for several decades so in the entire constituent assembly like he didn't speak a single word about gandhi like okay. and prohibition only adivasi leaders they were the ones who spoke the most because for them liquor consumption is important as part of the culture okay so this is what you know <clears throat> what we can get you know if you have start from physical to like you know first level digitization optical characterization and then making it readable okay so in this case this guy is actually took up this initiative clpr folks and then they did the whole job and we also cleaned it up but you know if, if libraries can do some of these things you know so that makes the job of um, researchers much easier okay yeah so i don't know. other thing that we have uh, Now, this is a broader thing, you know, present information in a user format, and also like you know, you have to go beyond the keywords, you know, you know, and make the information easily accessible. 
and NLP and topics analysis right now it is the purview of you know mostly the data scientists who do these things but some of these elements can also be brought to the library science you know wherein they can learn uh, <coughs> use this natural language processing techniques and then catalog them subject classification can be made better so that topic discovery can be made even better with this right yeah and that will help us in actually textual data analysis and visualization okay this one example the second one i want to say is this um, data one is text other is the numerical data okay. so in pune we have this gokhale institute of public um, uh, sorry politics uh, and economics you know so you know in the servants of society place where gokhale lived okay so <coughs> This is on the premium set of our economics in India. So India census, uh, may, some of you might know, like it started way back in 1872 national level census, and we have bound volumes of the census at may, you know couple of places in India. Let's say in, International Institute of Population Sciences, Gokhale also has these things, and also like uh, Census Bureau also has these. Okay. So one good thing that they did was uh, they digitized this volume. Okay, if you go to their library, this is how you find any of them. They have documents dating back to even 1700s. Newspapers of the 1850s and 60s, they have those things, bound volumes. Okay, amazing research work can be done. But the thing is, many of those things remain unused because they are not fully digitized. But they did digitization exercise. Let's say for the census one. Okay, this is 1891 census, and in the census. you find these kind of table tables after tables huge ones right so entire part 2 of the census in 1872 1881 91 over okay, like you have tables so you don't find you hardly find any people actually working on this data like almost nil barring few like you know because it's very hard to analyze these things this digitization is also first level of digitization like you know these numbers are not converted into tables like you need actually numerical ones right so <clears throat> first level they did but second level is absolutely needed if you want to make it as a usable format so we did that partly initially through um like you know uh, manually putting numbers in some of the things primarily for analysis of the migration in the bombay presidency and madras and other places uh but later we also found out some ai tools to you know create Extract tables out of these things, okay? And this is the digital archive, you know, Gokhale Institute's wala digital archives of the Gokhale Institute, right? Here, so thanks to this analysis, you know, in fact, we have got 150 years of data, right? So 150 years of the population data, migration data, literacy data, and all, right? It's a huge thing, you know, in which we could tabulate these things, you know, <coughs> uh, textual and numerical metadata, and we could tag these things. so that helped us in actually doing much uh, you know good research and quantitative research of the historical documents okay and we got some amazing results on um, you know migration patterns in major cities in india like you know this is interstate migration in um, uh, like four cities in the bombay presidency uh, like you know and the second one is about intra province and uh, like uh, sorry uh, state migration third one is about international migration fourth one is about the sex ratio so these kind of results you know if you look at it long term trend analysis of the historical data you know could only be done you know if you uh, because of the digitization and also like extraction of the tables you know because of this okay yeah so other thing that we can also do is you know analysis of the topics topic analysis as they call it in the nlp thing so like i'm also working on this uh, integration of india part quantitative analysis of that okay of course i have to read many books but the thing is if there are so many things um, you have to go through them manually tag them in the traditional research methods but and uh, it can be facilitated if the books can be split into chapters and each chapters can be uh, analyzed visually using textual analysis tools you know this is the one of the chapters from the book vp menon's uh, like you know unsung architect of the modern india states ministry so what you see is that you know <clears throat> so if you want to know about a particular thing but you don't have to read the entire book but 
to know where exactly you can find the information you need textual processing so immediately you know with this analysis i could figure out that there is a lot of things about the uh, like you know a state ministry which were involved in the integration of india and where all they occur the document segmentation and that helps in quick reading of the text and actually analyzing that, right so this kind of thing like say if you see a book physical book there is if you look at the even uh, the table of contents many a times you don't know what those chapters are actually talking about either you go and take the pains of reading the entire thing but there are alternative means you know to use this nlp techniques to see what this chapter is about right so <clears throat> that can be facilitated which helps in actually making people read okay it is similar to what was talked about in the morning like augmented reality you know that they talked about so nowadays many school textbooks are also coming up with their you know chapters it's not just a book but there are qr codes for the books so if you go and scan let's say a chapter okay you will get some interactive materials regarding those right so in that way our school textbooks are also changing their character okay so they are creating more you know digital tools to encourage reading okay in the morning we saw that video of augmented reality when they are trying to see how the listening actually sound perception actually happens okay so here we don't have that level of augmented reality but we have some you know learning materials which are digitized okay so textbook qr codes it can be made integrated into interactive materials you can get automated book summaries chapter summaries you know through these kind of uh, um, methods okay so <clears throat> that's why like you know this book should definitely be read but it should be supplemented with you know this kind of uh, interactive material that's where i say that you know we need to have a coexistence of physical and the digital space you know of course we need physical space you know for scholarly and leisurely reading and writing and it also gives a structured space and it also disciplines us to sit and study digital space is you know doesn't give you a structured space it is um, totally random it is very much similar to what we had in covid time of course uh, <clears throat> everybody was forced to uh, st uh, go online but the thing is the learning outcomes were very poor because you know, i think some of the instructors know that like st students would not focus on this they would switch out their videos okay if there is purely digital space even though lot of learning content is available on the digital space very little reading actually got done but in the physical space in the classroom the <coughs> learning happening is much more in the same way like you know a physical space like library can provide for that uh, thing and it can also be uh, it should be a space for the community to engage and interact right and that can also act as a space for the digital access you know making free wifi access to information and tools for research and analysis okay yeah i think that's it from my side yeah. thank you comments so i think thank you for a very good very well researched presentation it was enlightening do you see any scope for incorporating some content from your talk in our lis education for library science students also can pick up such trends as part of their research work and things like that yeah absolutely like um, so all the textual material right like you know <clears throat> if it can be presented in a different format in a visual format and an interactive format many tools are actually available like even ai tools are there right. you know which can be integrated in fact it should be taught in the library science itself you know because yeah, at the end it the idea is to disseminate knowledge but it not need not be purely in the physical form or just a scanned form right yeah data mining is a kind of data mining area. yeah so well. currently it is usually the data scientists and data miners like us you know who do these things but if some of this task can already be done by the librarians then it makes the life much easier for us you know for example for the migration thing that i did census document it took almost a year for us to digitize and let's say make it in a usable format because it was not ocr that created a big headache for us to putting those numbers each and everything right but if the library can ensure a proper digitization process proper tagging 
like you mentioned in the morning like in times of india it's not only the physical copies which are digitized but every article okay. it has an heading and the textual material and also the individual keywords i know of people uh, who have used times of india material to understand let's say how caste was mentioned in 1850s correct you know when did the sedition word actually come in the press those type of you know hard quantitative analysis can be done only if you archive these things in a proper digital manner with proper metadata inscribed in it okay other thing what as a researcher what we face is india has lot of digital uh, you know you know is doing lot of digitization of the documents but no proper metadata and tagging is associated for example shodh ganga like where we have all this phd thesis in india so there the problem is when you try to access sometimes the thesis names don't come up if you know the thesis name then you can too. but the thing is if you have the keywords it doesn't show up the proper uh, thesis it will say chapter 1 but what is chapter 1 chapter 1 means something right so how do we know this chapter 1 of this thesis contains so and so for an, as an end user i want the library science folks to at least give us that thing so that enable the crawling you know web should crawl like you know you know <coughs> tagging so that searching becomes easy if you can't search then the material is useless okay for example some census documents are there for indian history research whenever i search the national archive i don't get the material i go to british archives in the, or in the columbia university and then like michigan they have far better archives than india like why should i go to them like you know, to study india okay. so at least indian libraries you know should do that do that in fact yeah. during lunch break some youngsters they ask me what kind of career options we can have other than traditional thing this is what nearia library science students can get into mm -hmm. what you are explaining very interesting it is yeah. congratulations yeah. thank you sir any other questions comments okay uh, if not uh, let's thank professor chola once <laughs>